Welcome to Zooming In. I'm Simone Gao. March 4th marks the eighth day of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. During these eight days, we've seen the bravery of the Ukrainian people, increasing damage of the war, and more and more indiscriminate attacks from the Russian side. However, what we can't see clearly is the way out of this catastrophe. Will Russia lose the war? If not, how is this going to end? And when we talk about how it's going to end, we also need to talk about how it all started. Was it avoidable in the first place? Today, I had these discussions with Neil McCabe. He is the national political editor for the Start News Network, and a media fellow at the Washington-based Gold Institute for International Strategies. Mr. McCabe is a veteran of the Iraq War, where he deployed for 15 months as a combat historian. Thank you, Neil, for joining, zooming in today. Simone, it's great to be with you. Thank you for having me on. Okay, let's talk about the situation in Ukraine. Yesterday, a training facility building at Ukraine's biggest nuclear power plant was hit by Russian projectiles, and Ukrainian firefighters extinguished the fire, uh, luckily. But why do you think the Russians are hitting nuclear facilities now? I think right now the Russians are still taking the position or the posture that they want to show that this is a serious military incursion. They want to show the power that their military has, that their, that their military cannot be stopped. But at the same time, there is tremendous fraternity culturally and socially and economically and frankly politically between the Russians and the Ukrainians and so they are hesitant to uh, cause unnecessary, what they would call unnecessary civilian casualties. And certainly they don't want to destroy the nuclear power plant, which is one of the largest in the world and certainly the largest nuclear complex in Europe, because that would be just an absolutely horrific disaster for everyone involved. But at the same time, they want to let people know that they're not fooling around and they could hit those reactors if they wanted to. Hmm, okay, so hitting the nuclear uh, plant the facility is not by accident, it's intentional. There's no way it's an accident. The, all of the significant targets in Ukraine that were long ago established, the grid coordinates have already been programmed into their targeting computers. The Russians know every inch of Ukraine, they know where their targets are, and they're just going down their list. Okay, okay. So how do you comment on Russian army's performance so far? Is their logistics bad? I think right so far the Russian army has demonstrated tremendous restraint considering that it is an invading force. It certainly is a very powerful, well-equipped, well-trained military in a stark contrast to the Russian army that we saw go into Georgia in 2008. That military did not have a very good equipment. It did not have discipline. It was not, it was not a ready for prime time military. Uh, it was going against the Georgians, which was you know, even worse than the Russians. But certainly, if you look at the incursion in 2008 into Georgia, and then you project forward to the Russian military today, it's night and day. Hmm. It's interesting that you said that, because if we hear the mainstream report, a mainstream media's report, uh, they're all talking about how the Russian army is not quite ready for this war. For example, why is the convoy outside Kiev not moving for days? Well, you know, there was a, a German general who bragged about uh, the Nazi invasion of U Yugoslavia. They subdued Yugoslavia in less than a month. And when he was asked about the invasion and conquest of Yugoslavia, he said it was not so much an invasion, but a military parade. That's how easy it was. Well, <laughs> for the next three or four years, the Germans had to have 200,000 troops tied down in Yugoslavia because of the insurgency 
uh, that was rising up against them because the Germans blew through so quickly, they didn't take the time to actually subdue areas and really take control of the territory. So we also see that the United States Army moved very quickly to conquer Afghanistan and Iraq, and both times were tied down by insurgencies. And so maybe one of the lessons learned is to take your invasion slow and do it methodically and sort of and secure the areas one by one in such a way that you don't have an insurgency after you capture the, the capital. There is no opposing force to the Russians of any significance. The, the Russians dominate the air, and so they can have a 20, 30, 40 mile convoy column go through enemy territory without even worrying about attacks except for maybe a few drones. And so the fact that they're moving slowly is not really a case that they are weak or stalled. It's really remarkable that they can take their time. Hmm. Okay. What you said is very interesting because this is uh, very much against a Chinese military strategy like Sunzi. So Sunzi is all about Bing Gui's Shen Su, that means military needs to move fast. You never want your military to move slow. You never win a situation, win a war when your army uh, moves slow. But you were saying the opposite. Well, I think you have to remember that, that you know, Chinese military strategy is effective for China, whereas Russian military strategy or science is developed, you know, in the Russian experience. And Russia was conquered, you know, huge swaths of Russia were conquered by the German army in 19, in the early 1940s. And so, but, you know, then of course you had the Germans tied down, you know, by you know, Stalingrad and Leningrad. And basically, you know, the, the experience in Russia destroyed the German Wehrmacht so that, you know, Hitler, there was no way Hitler could win the war because of his invasion of Russia, which happened very, very quickly. The Russians take a long view. They took a long view with Napoleon. They took a long view with Hitler. And in the case of Ukraine, they're also taking a long view. I think there were some miscalculations. I suspect that Russian President Vladimir Putin had every expectation that Russian-speaking Ukrainians would come over to his side and welcome him. And he must have also thought that there was a chance for Ukrainian military leaders, especially the most senior leaders, to come over to his side. When you consider that so many of the senior Ukrainian military leaders were trained in the Soviet military system, went to Soviet military academies, and for years, the U Ukrainian army and the Russian army operated as allies in the Warsaw Pact. Not, those two things did not happen. I would call that a miscalculation, but certainly nothing that would stop Putin from driving forward. He is in this to win it, and he is not turning around. Okay, so the bottom line is you think the convoy uh, start uh, because it's not because of the logistics, it's, it's by plan. But uh, this raises another question. I mean, isn't the time not on Russia's side? I mean, if they, who, who could uh, afford a war of attrition, Russians or Ukrainians? Well, I would not bet against the Russians in a long war. They take an extremely long view of history and conflicts. And as I said before, the examples of how the Russians beat Napoleon and Hitler was taking the long view. They are not doing a quick hit. They don't do quick hits. And so, you know, the Russians, is a, they are a bigger, more wealthier, more populous nation than Ukraine. They are one of the world's largest producers of oil. And the price of oil is over $100 a barrel when a year ago it was under $40 a barrel. In fact, President Biden has specifically refused to sanction 
or in any way interrupt the Russian oil business. And so they're making more money than they've made in years. Right, right. Yeah, U.S. is still importing Russia oil as of today. Uh, let's talk about that later. But uh, uh, so y you think there's no problem for the Russians to get logistic supplies from maybe Belarus or other parts of uh, uh, through the border to Ukraine to supply their army? Uh, I don't see any impediments to the Russian invasion. And I think that they deserve credit for taking it slow and being judicious in their attacks. Certainly, their patience is going to run out. At least in this stage of a conflict or any conflict, Simone, what happens to the soldiers who are actually fighting is that they are struggling with the idea that it, the fear of killing is as great or greater than the fear of being killed. And so soldiers who are fresh into battle are hesitant to shoot to kill their enemies. They'll try to wound them. They'll aim for the arms. They'll aim for the legs. They'll shoot over their heads to try to scare them. But they don't want to kill their enemy because that's, it's an innate thing in our bodies and our souls that we don't want to take another life. But what happens is once the casualties start piling up and a unit reaches 20 to 30% killed and wounded. The soldiers who remain on the line, they realize that they are in a fight for their lives and they are also angry at the enemy that shot and killed their comrades. Those soldiers become very tough, serious war fighters. We see it in the interviews with the Russian prisoners that the Ukrainians put uh, videos of these interviews where the Russian soldiers say, I don't know why I'm here. I don't want to kill. I don't want to fight the Ukrainians. This is very natural. Every soldier goes through this in the beginning of the conflict. But we're now reaching that next phase where these are bloody troops and they become very serious killers. Okay, so we're definitely seeing casualties, uh, civilian casualties even going up. So we are witnessing what you are talking about. Is that right? Well, what happens with the civilian casualties is the same thing. In the beginning, the civilians are saying, okay, the, the Russians are here, but what does that have to do with me? But once once their relatives and the, the, the their friends and people have their homes destroyed, their work destroyed, and they, their family members are killed, those civilians will also become hard killers. And so that fear of killing goes away once you start your side starts absorbing serious casualties. And so in the first phase of the war, it's it, there's going to be hesitancy on both sides. But once the bodies start piling up, all of that goes away. Yeah. You know, there is a report that Russia used vacuum bombs and aviation thermal, a thermal barrack bomb of increased power, the father of all bombs. What does that tell you about Putin? Well, Putin needs to win. No matter what the cost of winning is, the cost of losing is more. So he has to win. Once he wins and is able to settle things down, he can make friends with whoever, who, whoever he now has to make friends with. But right now, once you've invaded a country, you have to finish the job. You do not want to be chased out of Ukraine. And that is not going to happen. Okay. So, you know, I'm just watching Putin's television speech um, a week ago. And he said, he said this, a bloody military operation was waged against Belgrade. He was talking about the NATO's bombing of Yugoslavia. He said, without the UN Security Council's sanction, combat, uh, combat aircraft and missiles used in the heart of Europe, the bombing of peaceful cities and, and, and uh, a vital infrastructure went on for several weeks. So, if this is what he said about NATO, how does he justify what he is doing in Ukraine? You know. 
Well, I think what he's saying is that the Europeans and NATO has no business lecturing him. And remember, you know, World War I really started when Arch, the Archduke of Hungary, or excuse me, uh, Austria-Hungary, was killed in Serbia by a Serbian separatist. The Russians got in the war in defense of Serbia because the Russians see themselves as the big brother of the other Orthodox countries. 70% of Ukraine is Orthodox, either Ukrainian Orthodox or Russian Orthodox. And so they see a kinship with the Orthodox in Ukraine and the kinship with what happened in Serbia. When, when, the, when, the, when the Western countries led by the United States and England went into Serbia, Russia had to sit there and watch. They could do nothing because they were bankrupt and they were broken. Well, they're not bankrupt and they're not broken anymore. Hmm. Okay. But isn't this war going to put a big toll on Russia's economy? How is their economy doing? I mean, ruble uh, plunged like a 40%. I mean, their stock market plunged 40%. I mean, their economy can't last. What do you think? The, the Russian culture, the Russian character, the Russian people, they will eat sticks and rocks <laughs> to survive. They will ride this thing out. And it's like, you know, the idea, you can't threaten the Russians with poverty because they understand that that is part of war and they will gut it out. And they're certainly not going to surrender in exchange of a bite for a, a bowl of rice. But are the Russian people on Putin's side? Well, there's gonna be splits, you know? There's interaction between the West and the Russians, and certainly their Russian oligarchs and their children who enjoy being in the West, do business in the West. Yeah, it's going to hurt. And there are friendships and there are relationships. And I will tell you that the Russian people do not want to see the Ukrainians suffer because they feel a kinship to the Ukrainians. But this is not really a war of Russia's choosing. Russia said, we do not want the Ukraine in NATO. They've been saying it for 15 years. And everyone just ignores them and just laughs at them. And so, you know, after 15 years, they have to fix it. And of course, they see an opportunity to fix it with the weakness of President Joseph R. Biden Jr. They do not take him seriously in the least. Hmm. Okay. We can talk about that a little bit uh, later, uh, but what do you think Putin's warning of getting nuclear weapons ready? Does this mean he is desperate at this stage or is he just bluffing or is it, I mean, is it really possible that he could use it? I don't really have any insight on that. I'm not even sure where those reports came from. It could be something that the order went out and that Western intelligence agencies picked up on it. But everyone knows that the Russians have the nukes. And if he's signaling that he'll use it, you know, it's a game of chicken, unfortunately. And so in the end, there's a thermal nuclear war. They attack us, we attack them, and we're living in caves for the next thousand years. So I would hope that Putin was just sort of bluffing or just sort of signaling how serious he is. But it's a it's a very dangerous thing, and it it shows how the Biden administration stumbled into this crisis without considering the risks. Hmm. Okay. Then, what do you think of uh, Pentagon's decision to postpone the missile tests? I mean, in order to de-escalate Russia's nuclear threat. There is a faction inside the Pentagon that wants to denuclearize the United States military. At one time, the Pentagon in the Defense Department was sort of a conservative bastion. That's no longer the case. Just like other federal agencies, 
like the Justice Department or the State Department, the Pentagon is dominated by, by leftists. And so the idea that they found an excuse to sort of put the brakes on the remilitarization or the uh, rebuilding of the nuclear deterrent, it doesn't really surprise me. I don't know what you need to do to de-escalate other than tell Putin, Ukraine will not join NATO. I don't think Putin is, uh, you know, I don't think he's in a situation where he would misinterpret a scheduled missile launch, right? Uh, he knows that we have these things scheduled and he would just, I would assume he would understand that we're not making any kind of threat. You know, but it just shows to show you sort of the ham-fisted way that this administration is handling things, in particular, the Pentagon. The Pentagon went to the Chinese and gave the Chinese a full-on intelligence review or briefing of everything that was going on in Russia. And then the Chinese went around and told the Russians exactly what we had on them. This is like, it just shows you the naivete of the people running our military. Hmm. Okay. You know, another thing is uh, some of the Ukrainian officials report on, you know, the so-called heroic acts by the Ukrainian military has been proven false. And they were fabricated. For example, the story about the ghost of Ukraine and the 13 soldiers who refused to surrender on the island and died in the end. Uh, those are fabricated uh, fabricated so what do you think of this and do you think um the need to boost morale justify fabricating stories will this hurt or benefit the ukrainians in the end well this uh, the old saying is that the first casualty in war is the truth and so we're seeing this uh you know so many of these sort of war stories and atrocities are just recycled and they're just old stories that are just basically recycled and <laughs> painted up as new stories. And you see this all the time. It's just propaganda and well-meaning people reported it thinking that they were feel-good stories. It's, it's going to happen on both sides. And I'm glad that uh, the media was able to sort of catch it and make the corrections. Certainly that doesn't happen in other wars, but I think that the media has been quick to sort of correct itself. Mm, okay. I mean, the casualties uh, report from Russia and from Ukraine are very, very different. Uh, Russian side said they only have 490 some something soldiers uh, have died so far. The Ukrainians said they have killed over 5,000 Russian soldiers. Which side should we believe? Yeah, I think it's a, there's no way of knowing the truth. But I will remind you that troop strength is a very tightly guarded number. And when an army is in a conflict in a hot war, do not expect that army to tell you the truth about its troop strength because it endangers their tr it endangers the troops that are still on the field and so there has to be some independent reporting and analysis once the war sort of settles down into uh, wherever the battle lines are going to be drawn well then we'll have more solid reporting but in the first weeks of a conflict i would not expect any army to be honest about its casualties mm -hmm. Uh, according to your observation, how is the Ukrainian army doing so far? I think the Ukrainian army is performing well in bits and pieces, but from my eye, it's very decentralized, and I don't see a lot of combined force. I'm not seeing infantry and armor working together. I'm seeing no air cover or any kind of serious attack from the air. There was the opportunity for the Ukrainians to go to Poland and fly uh, 
Polish jets, the Polish government said that the Ukrainians could take some of their jets and attack the Russians with them. But the Secretary General of NATO flew to Poland and told Poland, stop helping the Ukrainians. Do not give the Ukrainians these planes because that would be an escalation and give the Russians an excuse to attack Poland, thus triggering Article 5. And so you see where the line is drawn. We will give them Stinger missiles. We will give them bandages and blankets. We will give them bags of flour. But we're not going to give them any kind of serious military hardware that would change the dynamic on the battlefield. Hmm. Okay. I thought they were starting to give Ukrainians those lethal weapons, you know, stingers. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure, they get the tow missiles and the stingers, you know, so they can shoot down helicopters and they can take out tanks. But the, the Poles were going to give them real fighter jets. And real fighter jets could go up and down that 20, 30 mile column that's coming into their country and really do some damage. I mean, that would have ended the conflict. In fact, if if the Poles or even NATO had created that no-fly zone, or if the Poles or NATO had actually attacked that convoy from the air, the invasion would be over. But NATO is not taking those steps. And Putin knows it. Right. Uh, how, I mean, does Ukraine have a real air force? Even if they get the air, I mean, the fighter jets, can they fly it? I don't know the exact number, but I have not seen any significant action by a Ukrainian air force. And it's this, if you had an air force, this would be the time to use it. And they're not using it, whatever right. they have. Right. It's just so amazing that that 40 mile convoy is just sitting there and there's no attack from the air. Right. But it just uh, it just tells you the situation that the Ukrainians are in. It, you know, my dear father used to always tell me you have to play the cards that you are dealt. Those are the cards. The cards in your hand are the ones you can play. Everything else is fantasy. So when Biden was telling President Zelensky of Ukraine to hang in there and don't give in, well, what, you know, he was telling Zelensky that we were in his corner, that we would somehow stand up for him. And we really haven't. Right. You know, it's. It's terrible for the Ukrainians that they had to rely on the United States. So how will the Ukrainian war end in the end? Will it be determined by the outcome of the battlefield or political factors? Well, you know, uh, Klausowitz said that war is politics, uh, just an extension of politics. But, you know, borders and treaties are in peace is established by war and anything you know it's you can try to make a treaty you can try to do these things uh without a war but it just doesn't have the same effect wars are how problems are settled in the end especially when you have intransigence and there's a lot of things going into this conflict but the main thing is a frustration with the disrespect shown to the Russians by the United States and her NATO allies who are using Ukraine as a cat's paw. And the idea that Ukraine would someday become a NATO country was just something that the Russians could not accept. Right. Right. And this is not being reported uh, much on the mainstream media. I guess it's a kind of a political, politically incorrect. Uh, but I, I want to ask you, Russia asked Ukraine to demilitarize and denazify. 
Ukraine said that's not going to happen. Do you think a neutralization of Ukraine is still possible? Biden asked. Uh, Biden said, I mean, he would support Ukraine if it decides to neutralize. What do you think? Well, first of all, I hesitate to accept the characterization of Ukrainian nationalists as Nazis. I think that that's an old school Cold War uh, epithet that the Soviets applied to their enemies with really recklessness. And so the Ukrainian, there are Ukrainians who fought with the German army, but this was not motivated by any kind of, you know, love of Nazism or love of Hitler. It's, uh, you know, the Russian, ar excuse me, the German army rolled into Ukraine and said, we are fighting the Russians. And so the Ukrainians had a choice and they signed up with the Germans who were fighting the Russians. But, you know, what are you, what are you supposed to argue with the German army as it rolls into your town? Well, you know, that's that. Uh, I think that if Biden is saying now he will accept a neutral Ukraine, then this just proves how ridiculous the Biden foreign policy has been. Because if he had said it one month ago, so many thousands of civilians and soldiers would not have been wounded or killed. And we wouldn't have had this tearing of the fabric of Europe right before our eyes. For what? What was the point? It's all he had to do is say, Ukraine will not go into NATO. And now he's willing to accept a neutral Ukraine that isn't even allied or friendly with the United States. Well, it's it's really sad and terrible. Uh, and Putin was very wise to to take this chance against Biden and his team. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, now it's a I think it's kind of a politically impossible to walk back from the stance that we need to fight, the Ukrainians need to fight on. Uh, the West is behind you, we support you, we never surrender. It's very hard politically to walk back from that stance. But on the battlefield, if the Ukrainians just can't win and the West is not going to send troops and really help, I mean, how, how is this going to end? Well, it, it will end in a disgrace for the West and the United States. You know, one of the reasons why so many uh, European, Eastern European ethnic immigrants and citizens of the United States remained in the Democratic Party after other parts of the Democratic Party coalition had gone to the Republican Party was because the Eisenhower administration encouraged the people of Hungary to rebel against their Soviet masters. And then when the Hungarians stood up to the Russians and their sort of Hungarian keepers, the United States did nothing. And it was a terrible disgrace and it really called out Eisenhower and his foreign policy. And my own father, went to Logan Airport in Boston in 1956 as a young man. And there were Ukrainians who had escaped from, excuse me, there are Hungarians who had escaped from Hungary and they were filled up this plane and the plane landed at Boston's Logan Airport. And my father was part of a welcoming crowd of thousands of Bostonians to welcome the Hungarians to the United States. But all of them knew that the United States had betrayed the Hungarians. And it took a long time for people to trust the United States again. And we just went back to square one. If I'm a Ukrainian and an American makes me a promise, I, I gotta wonder, what, what is that promise worth? Hmm, okay. That's sad. But uh, I mean, do you think Russians will really win this war? There is no way the Russians lose 
this war? Why? Well, they have more money. They have more soldiers. They have more equipment. They have a strategic advantage of geography. They have pro-Russian separatists who have already been stood up in the Donbass and Crimea, who have already been fighting in Ukraine, who are familiar with the terrain. And who's going to stop them? The Ukrainians can't stop them. And the West isn't going to stop them. China isn't going to stop them. No one can stop them. What about the sanctions? If uh, the West install crippling sanctions on Russia, would that make them stop? No, because the Russians... Yeah, you just said the Russians are not afraid of that. They're not afraid of it. And you know, Biden gave... Biden opened his State of the Union address with a tribute to the Ukrainian people. But then we're still buying Russian oil. Biden would rather have the United States buy Russian oil than have Americans produce their own oil. And remember, if oil is $100 a barrel or more, that finally makes solar and wind power which you know, Biden and his Democratic allies and their allies in the media, they have a religious zealotry, zealotry when it comes to you know this renewable energy. It's a, it's there's a religious fervor about this, you know, the wind and the solar. And you know, even though it's completely uneconomical, even though it, you know, the, the only way it works is with tremendous tax subsidies. Or if oil is $150 a barrel, well, then maybe it makes sense to have solar finally. Yeah, yeah, that's that's crazy. That's just doesn't make any sense. Uh, I want to ask you about the negotiation between Russia and Ukraine. They just had the second round of negotiation. Uh, not much have come out of it. What do you what do you see the prospect of negotiation? Well, I think the Ukrainians can negotiate some sort of Ukrainian federation of the Russian Republic, at least in the East, where the bulk of the Russian speakers and the Orthodox uh, Church members are, and sort of keeping the West uh, as a sort of an independent Ukraine. But I just don't see what power to negotiate Zelensky has. I, you know, it's, it's a very sad and terrible situation because, you know, 50 years ago, a Chinese uh, leader, uh, Don, uh, 50 years ago, Mao Zedong said that the United States was a paper tiger. Well, looks like we're a paper tiger. And certainly the way we handled Afghanistan was, did not give any confidence that we, would, that we would be a worthy opponent. I mean, when you look back at Afghanistan, you know, when we closed our airfield in Bagram, we didn't even tell anyone. We didn't even tell the Afghans that we were doing it. We just shut off the lights at midnight and left. We left like two or 300 vehicles at the, at the airfield and we took the keys with us. It was, it was, it was shabby, and it was cowardly. And when the, you know, when our allies looked at that, and when our rivals looked at that, they just said these guys aren't for real. You could really do whatever you want, and Biden's not going to do anything about it. Hmm. You know, it's uh, very sad to hear those uh, things, but maybe one saving grace is, uh, you know, even on Biden's part is he said we're not going to be involved in Ukraine, in Europe, because our entire attention is on West Pacific. We're looking, we're watching China. W what do you think? Does that have a point? Does he have a point? Well, you know, the Biden, President Biden and his family 
received more than $30 million from the Chinese, according to author Peter Schweitzer in his book, Red Handed. Certainly, the Bidens are compromised. And so, one benefit to one benefit for Biden in this Ukraine crisis is that nobody is talking about China and nobody's talking about inflation and nobody's talking about interest rates going up and nobody's talking about all the other problems that the United States is facing. Biden has no interest going after China. And so the longer the Ukraine crisis dominates the headlines, it's almost like a free pass for him. Mm. That said, I hope you I hope you are wrong, but I, I hope I'm wrong too. You know, it's I take no joy in saying this. Uh, I didn't, you know, I wasn't I wasn't a supporter of uh, the Biden campaign or candidacy, but when he was inaugurated and put in the White House, I said to I hope it works. You know, I don't agree with his ideas and I don't agree with his policies. But that doesn't mean I want I want him or the United States to fail. I would love for him to prove me wrong. I would love for this Biden foreign policy to be successful. It, it would be great for everybody if he and his people knew what they were doing. But they yeah. don't know what they're doing and people are getting killed. Yeah. Let's go back to uh, the Ukraine war. After the Ukrainian war, what do you think will happen to NATO expansion? And what about EU expansion? For all intents and purposes, NATO expansion in the East will stop with the failure to integrate Ukraine. There's really no place else for it to go. And I think it's going to force people to step back and say, what is it about a North Atlantic Treaty Organization designed to confront the threat to Western Europe from the Soviet Union, where the countries in Western Europe, especially Germany, are doing business with Russia, and there is no more Soviet Union, and so you have to, people have to ask, what was the point of NATO? Certainly NATO expansion stops because they have nowhere else to go. But I think people have to look at it and say, you know, it was a great time. It served its purpose, but let's shut it down. Hmm. Okay. What about EU expansion? It'll be very interesting to see what the European Union does now that Ukraine has formally asked to join the European Union. But in many ways, the idea of the European Union has gone the way of the idea of NATO. When England successfully, when the United Kingdom successfully left the European Union through Brexit, other European countries said to themselves, you know what, maybe we could go it alone too. And we see that Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, he is able to exercise a sort of Britain first foreign policy because he is not shackled by any kind of economic restraints from the European Union. He is able to go to Poland, He's able to visit other countries. And certainly we saw that, that the United Kingdom entered the treaty or the pact with the Australians in the United States for uh, to improve the defense of Australia against a uh, possible threat from China. Boris Johnson was able to do that more easily because he wasn't in the European Union. It's given England a free hand. And so I think other countries are going to see that. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens. But, you know, the European Union is basically France and Germany keeping an eye on each other. And everybody, everything else is secondary. That's interesting. What do you think Putin's end game 
is in Ukraine, and uh, do you think he can achieve that? Putin's end game is to have a stable pro-Russian neighbor to the south. And he will be able to collect those sort of independent regions, which he has now recognized as, uh, I guess, many republics. But he doesn't want to have to worry about his southern flank. And over the long term, having a neutralized Ukraine is great for the Russians. It's There's nothing wrong with having a pro-Russian neutral or, uh, or even neutral uh, Ukraine to the south. And so in the end, it'll be worth it. It'll be bloody. It will be expensive. There will be people who protest. There are people who don't understand and don't appreciate his goals. But in the end, Putin will achieve it. Hmm. So, uh, I mean... You mean he wants to wreck Ukraine? He wants Ukraine to no longer be a sovereign country, but divided into different pieces, and he can grab some. Well, I, I don't know how he's going to shake it down. I mean, there, he could take everything to. Uh, there's a river that goes uh, north and south through the center of the country. He could decide that everything to the east of that river will be a, you know, a Russian state. Uh, or some kind of uh, independent federation inside the Russian orbit. But, you know, Putin was, Putin was fine with a sovereign Ukraine for many years. It's just he could not stand the idea that Ukraine would join NATO. And remember, there was a coup in 2014 where the democratically elected government was overthrown by a street movement that many people say was supported and financed by the CIA. Certainly Putin blames the United States and the CIA for the 2014 coup. And the most important issue in that coup was the idea that there were the United States with the Biden State Department and contractors hired by the State Department working in Ukraine basically wanted Ukraine to join the European Union. And that was the big fight. And so, you know, we'll see how that happens. You know, Russia would like to create its own version of the European Union. And so why wouldn't they do that, especially when you consider that Red China, the number two economy in the world, would be part of that Russian economic system? Hmm. Okay. That's just all bad stories. Uh, what do you, I mean, these are all my questions. Do you have anything else to add, Neil? I just want to say that it is very uncomfortable for me to speak academically or clinically about the crisis in Ukraine because I know in my heart that there are terrible tragedies going on and the loss of life and the destruction of property is just absolutely horrific and it was absolutely avoidable. And so I, I just want to make that point that for the purposes of our discussion, I had to speak, you know, in a very clinical way, but that doesn't mean that my heart does not go out to the suffering of the Ukrainian people. And I just, I just wish this avoidable tragedy had been avoided. Thank you, Neil. That's it for today. Thanks for watching Zooming In with Simone Gao. Please like, share, subscribe, and donate to this program if you like my content. We're also in the process of making an in-depth report on the Russian-Ukrainian war. It will be out next week. So stay tuned. I'm Simone Gao, and I'll see you next time.